The second person I'm going to refer to is Viktor Frankl. Anybody here familiar with Viktor Frankl? A few, okay? For those of you who are not, allow me to mention. Viktor Frankl was a young physician living in Vienna with his bride, mother, father, brother, and sister. They were all thrown into concentration camps in the Second World War. Viktor Frankl's bride died, his mother died, his father was put to death, his brother died, his sister got out, and after four and a half years in three different concentration camps, Viktor Frankl was released. He came to the United States, spent time in Boston, spent time in San Diego, wrote, lectured, and uh, conducted business for several years prior to his passing a few years ago. But he talks about in his writings, he would talk about how he would be there with these men in, the, in these concentration facilities. He said, I would see these men, and he said, I would see them picking up a cigarette. Their hands would be trembling. He said, I knew that was the last cigarette they would smoke. He said, they were broken physically, they were broken emotionally, they were broken mentally. He talks about standing in front of the concertina wire, whatever that wire was that encased these poor souls. He said, among other things, he said, I can remember the men walking through the huts, comforting others, giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in numbers, but they offer significant proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing. The last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. The first 20 to 25 minutes are authentic, they are realistic, they're bombastic, there's gore, there's death, there's mayhem, there's trauma. I saw that film on a Saturday night in Leeds, England. And as these images came out, I'm sitting there and I hear laughter coming from the back of the theater. I turned around, what is this? And it was teenagers, kids, you know, kids and younger kids. They thought seeing a guy take a round through the helmet or lose an arm or drown because he couldn't get his web gear off, they thought that was kind of funny. The older people, people with gray hair or no hair, sat there transfixed on that screen. We all heard the same words, we saw the same images, we heard the same sounds. Two different types of people inter inter interpreting those images, words, and sounds. To this day, one Saturday, building up to Christmas in Leeds, they have a reenactment of that bombing. 77 people were killed in nighttime bombing in Leeds, England, and they do a reenactment. I've stood there. You get in front of the city hall on one Saturday night, they turn out all the lights. 15 to 20,000 people show up, and all you hear, first of all, you see these big beams, these big searchlights going on. Then you have this, hear this deafening roar of sound coming over, and the reenacting bombers going over, dropping bombs. It's to remind those people of what that community, what that country, what that city went through in the Second World War. Now, unless these kids had a good teacher or a, a good mentor, <laughs> an uncle, brother, who was, well, not a brother, but an older person, grandfather, who was through that, went through that, and explained it to them, the kids didn't get it. It didn't mean anything to them. They were having a good time. Words, images, and sounds mean different things to different people. I call it the magic wand syndrome. When you're contacting a particular prospect or establishing a relationship with a new customer, ask them something like, you know, John, I know you've worked, you've worked a lot of suppliers over the years, and you would know this before you make that statement, but you do some research on your prospect list, and uh, you have experience in supervising people and working for people. In your experience, if you had a magic wand, could you describe how you'd like our relationship to be? And sit back and see what they have to say. How often would you like to meet, John? Would you like the communication to be over the phone, text messaging, uh, voice? Uh, you want to meet, if, assuming you can do it geographically, it's possible. How often would you like to meet in person? Let them define the relationship. They all have experience in working with people. Give them the opportunity to define your relationship. <laughs> I said you are a superstar. Thank you for doing the research on the IRF. Oh, no, no, well, you were a great You're help. Totally engaged. And Louise is, is president of of IMA, right? I will be the new president. The new of president, IMA. president waiting. There yeah. you go. Yeah. And president of today? Anderson Performance Improvement as well. It went really well. First of all, the key to actually that kickoff is it is our own responsibility, and we have control over our own attitude. And boy, that is something that is so beautiful right. in front of you. Now it's all really up to them. Right. It's not those difficult. But I people. do okay. You did a great job. Oh.